Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Maxim Yurkin, and I will be talking about the discrete dipole approximation. First of all, uh, I would like to thank organizers for inviting me to this nice conference. And it's very unfortunate that I could not make it in person. So I record this talk to avoid any bandwidth issues uh, during the online presentation. However, I will be available online uh, to answer any of your questions. Uh, so first of all, uh, there is a small plan here, and well, I will start with basics and then continue to discuss uh, what is a discrete dipole approximation, what is it based on, what are various applications and existing computer codes that can be used, and by the end I will discuss some recent developments and also it, they will highlight one of the existing codes, add the code. And also important thing, I will talk about the simulation accuracy and finally some future plans for development, which is continuous. Uh, well, first of all, we are talking about light scattering. So I think at this conference, there is no need to introduce it. Uh, but specifically, and the most uh, interesting is um, elastic scattering. Well, it's maybe not the most interesting, but the one which I will be mostly talking about and uh, for which we have many methods to simulate light scattering. And why do we need these methods? Well, there are multiple applications uh, based on dispersed media, which can happen anywhere in the world surrounding us. And in many of these cases, there is not so much uh, means that we can use to well get in, to study or get any information about uh, those systems or particles in these systems. Um, so all this falls under the umbrella term remote sensing. Well, here are some examples uh, on the Earth, but they can be also far for some interstellar medium, or they can be really on some tabletop where we try to retrieve some information about some, say, nanoparticles. And uh, for all of these uh, applications, which usually um, include uh, some solution of the inverse problem, which is very interesting, but also very complicated, but in most cases, also some solution of the direct problem is needed. So direct problem is how to simulate uh, some scattering response of the particle if we know, well, know or assume everything about the particle. So be it sizes, uh, refractive indices, composition, etc. And for this scenario, there are many different methods. Uh, so I'm not going to argue that one method is better than the other. But among those, uh, there are a lot of the most general methods are probably volume discretization methods because they naturally apply to any, any inhomogeneous particles. So that can be considered the more generous, but even among them, you see there is a, a lot of uh, different options based on differential Maxwell equations or an equivalent form, which is volume integral equations. And that's only if we talk about frequency domain. So that's when we assume that we have some laser beam or some monochromatic radiation incidents on the particle. And so among the second class, one of the methods is discrete dipole approximation. Again, it's sometimes hard to distinguish where to put a um, line between different methods. Sometimes they are more or less equivalent, but have historically different names. Still, we will be talking about this method. Uh, to start uh, about this, uh, let me uh, first give some very clear, uh, simple physical picture. That is of a point dipole. Well, if you just place point dipole anywhere in space, then you know field everywhere surrounding space, which is given by this free space green stanza. It's, well, a, a bit uh, long expression, but still elementary, as you can see. So very simple functions are present here, and it's a tensor. So depending on the polarization of the dipole, you will have uh, different uh, electric fields. Uh, so that's given. And then if we assume that we have many different dipoles, then we can easily write down some linear equations which 
um, describe how these dipoles interact with each other and with the incident field, assuming that the dipole moment of each this point dipole is proportional to the field acting on it by everything else in the system. So by this, you get this uh, simple equation. And that's already basically you can call as a solution or not solution, but the main equations for a system of point type. So then if you have any particle, you can say some magic words like, let's assume that the particle can be represented by a set of uh, point dipoles, which is well kind of shown here in the picture. It's intuitively obvious that you can do it based on some atomistic description of the particle or uh, based on some understanding that if the sub-volume of the particle is small enough that it can be represented by point dipoles. So it seems very natural to use such method. And once you have these point dipoles, you already have the formulas that you need to solve uh, to determine, well, everything that you may need. However, this method uh, is not complete in the sense that it's hard to say what is its accuracy. So if you want uh, the letter, then it's better to start with uh, Maxwell equations. You can write them in the integral form as shown here. Again, not uh, delving into the details. Uh, we, we can use the volume discretization of these equations and arrive at essentially the same equations shown here. But the picture will be a, a bit different. So here we are explicitly using some cubical voxels. Actually, the voxels are not necessarily uh, Cubical, they can be cuboid, for example. So, for example, they can be elongated uh, at some, some directions. But it is still some cubical volumes, and we prefer them to be uh, situated on a regular grid. And after you do it, actually, well, these equations are the same, but there is some variations in how exactly you define this interaction between two dipoles and their polarizability, which uh, determ determ is determined by this Term. So there are some different formulations of the DDA in this respect uh, based on consideration of this finite volume that you have now, because now you have well-defined finite volume for each dipole. But after you solve these equations, which can be non-trivial, but still you get uh, dipole polarizations and from them you can compute anything you want. Any fields, internal, near fields, uh, far fields, scattering, some scattering amplitude, uh, ex extinction, absorption, scattering, cross-sections, whatever you want. And importantly, the DDA, at least when it's derived like this, is a numerically exact method, which means that if you refine discretization, so you fix the particle and take more and more voxels or dipoles to discretize the particle, then you will uh, have uh, better and better accuracy of your solution. So the method will converge to the true solution. Uh, another flexibility of the DDA comes from the fact that actually, if you look at the equations uh, here, the incident field is just the right hand side. So you can use any incident field. You only need to know its value on each of the dipoles. Well, usually in the center of these dipoles. Uh, so that means you can use any incident field. Can be plane wave, can be different beams. We will talk about a little bit about it later. It can be also some emitting dipole. So basically you put point dipole and by this you can model some quasi classical phenomena like fluorescence or Raman scattering. You can again put this emitting dipole in the particle and then you can model near field radiative transfer. So some thermal exchange, or you can even replace uh, this field uh, by that of the field of the passing electron. So again, seems to be not really related to scattering, at least not as the magnetic scattering, but uh, can be described by exactly the same equations. You just, you just change the incident field. Uh, next, let's uh, talk a little bit about computational issues. So for now, I was talking how the DD is a very nice and flexible method can be applied to any particles, many different uh, physical phenomena, etc. But uh, whatever you use it for, you need to solve a large system of linear equations. And well, sometimes it's moderately large, but it can be up to a billion, at least in my example it was, and there is actually no limit why you can't do further. Uh, the problem is that the matrix of the system is dense, so it's not sparse matrix as in some other methods. And immediately, if you know something about linear algebra, 
you may conclude that that's, these numbers are completely not feasible. However, we have a blessing here, which is a regular rectangular grid, which I already mentioned. That means that the green stanza will be translationally invariant, so it depends only on the distance between two voxels or dipoles, uh, but not on each direction independently. And that means that matrix is dense, but it has some special structure, which is called multi-level block toplets. It's kind of hard to show exactly this, but a toplets matrix is the one shown here. So basically, which is has the same values along each diagonal. And because of that, uh, so there is a lot of equal elements in this matrix. Uh, Meme requirements are not square of the size of the matrix, but only linear. And you can also compute matrix vector products using uh, some FFT-based convolution, basically in linear time of n. And if you then combine it with iterative solvers, which uh, usually converge in number of iterations, which is much smaller than the number of uh, voxels, uh, then you're lucky and you can get a basically method complexity, which is almost linear in terms of your typo. So then even these huge numbers become, well, maybe not easy, but at least feasible if you have a large uh, supercomputer. However, this uh, regular grid is also a curse because uh, once you look at the basis, basics of this method, you can well, propose many obvious improvements something like irregular grids, higher order basis functions, uh, some common preconditions for linear systems. So, well, there are many uh, options, but most of them will break this uh, regular structure or at least make it much more complicated to use FFT acceleration in this case. So because of that, many of these uh, are not used. And that means the DDA is a method like a hammer. So for some, it's very efficient. Uh, for some problems, it works very fine, but you can't really improve it much because then it will not be as robust <laughs> as it was uh, in the beginning. Well, I mentioned already uh, that there are many DDA formulations. So when we say about DDA, actually we, we, one can mean uh, many different things. Uh, however, again, I don't have time to discuss in detail. I, I will just show that most of the if you just read papers about different DDA formulation, they most deal with different ways to define plausibility. Uh, however, <laughs> the trick is that actually this plausibility does not affect that much the accuracy or speed of the simulation. What does affect is those two different formulations for the interaction part, because this affects only diagonal of the matrix, and this affects all the rest of the matrix, so all non-diagonal parts and all... Well, the accuracy and convergence of the iterative solver may greatly depend on which formulation you use. And there are not so many options here. But again, if you're interested in this, well, ask me questions or look at the literature. Uh, concerning applications, well, I already said, said that can, the DDA can be used uh, almost for any inhomogeneous, et cetera, particles. And so not surprisingly, it's used in almost any field of science where some scattering calculations or electromagnetic uh, calculations can be used. Uh, also, I have a special Hall of Fame, which uh, uh, well, which I sometimes had some papers to it, where the largest simulations are gathered. So if you're interested, like not just some nice pictures, but really computational um, capabilities or the limits of these capabilities current, then please uh, visit this link. Uh, well, a few more words about applications with nice pictures. <laughs> Uh, as I promised, is uh, that's for biological particles. Again, you can see that basically you can compute uh, well, almost anything. So if you have a model based on some considerations or based on some microscopic uh, measurements, then you can put this model and simulate it. But um, sometimes, for example, for neutrophil, okay, you have this complicated model, from the literature, but to really use it, you need to put like all the effective indices, which are not always known. So then when you come to simulations, in many cases, the model will be much simpler, but it's not because of the limitations of the DDA, but because of the um, uncertainty for model creation, that you just don't know all the variables that you need. Um, well, a few examples about complex atmospheric aerosols, 
well, maybe the most complicated I encountered in the literature, but many people use DDA also for much simpler shapes. Uh, also, it's possible to at least approach simulation of infinite and homogeneous objects. So in, in all cases, you will have some truncation, but you can play with it so and try to, uh, well, get some convergence. So basically, you increase the size of your system until, until you notice that the sum of the measurable quantities do not change. And then you can extrapolate those values to that of infinite media. So this can be semi-infinite media, I mean, infinite in one direction, so in all directions. Again, some examples are, he are shown here, and here we simulated, well, quite recently, up to 1 million spheres in aggregate, which is really a huge computational endeavor. For metallic nanoparticles, again, you can uh, simulate simple metallic nanoparticles and also in homogeneous ones. Uh, Actually, the DDA does have some problems uh, with metallic nanoparticles, so some other methods can be more suitable for that, but still uh, a lot of successful applications uh, can be found in this domain as well. Also, I think uh, what proves uh, quite convincingly the mat maturity of the method is that it's not only used for some say, single uh, nice simulations to produce one paper, but it's used for constructing databases. So when uh, basically each of these publica publication involves uh, usually thousands or hundreds of thousands simulations uh, of the DDA to produce some database, which is further used uh, either in this publication for some inverse problem or as in atmospheric, for example, many of these databases are, all, are already now part of the some production retrieval algorithm, which are used for satellite data, which is kind of produced and processed uh, in real time. Uh, a few words about uh, the existing codes. Well, surely there are a lot of codes exist. There are also uh, some, well, for example, at this page you can find, well, maybe not exhaustive, but close to the exhaustive list of existing codes, at least those that are openly available. Uh, but I think that um, two codes are used uh, predominantly, so they are most popular with a uh, large margin from other codes, the DDSCAT and ADDA. DDSCAT is old and uh, more pop popular. ADDA, well, I developed it myself, so there is some conflict of interest here, but I, I can argue that it's uh, it has more features. Some of them, unfortunately, are still in better stage, so we are not that fast in development as we should be. Uh, but still, it's... Uh, been developed and in some cases it's more efficient. So I will talk about it a bit more. Uh, well, first of all, if you're talking about that, a, a bit of bragging. So it's definitely reliable and trusted by the community. So it's used in many publications from many counties. And well, I even found out at some point that it's used by top uh, universities, like from top 10 of uh, any ranking that you can uh, find on the web. And it's also tested by comparison with other methods um, for different cases. So we are quite sure that there are no significant bugs that can affect uh, the produced data. Uh, so also the whole development process is open in the sense that you have access to current source code, issue tracker. So you you can get, study it and get your own understanding of, I mean, how, how well you can trust the code. Uh, also important that it uh, was from the start, the development of this code, it's a parallel implementation. So it's uh, it has both MPI-based uh, parallelization, which is suitable for clusters with distributed memory, which are most modern supercomputers. Uh, and then you can, Actually, using these clusters, you can reach uh, these huge uh, computational grids, which I mentioned. Uh, but it also works fine on your computer using a uh, single uh, thread, or it can use like multi-core processors. And also, it has a version which runs on GPUs. Uh, but sh you should not expect too much GPU acceleration. So maybe 10 times acceleration if you have a nice GPU card is possible, but not much more. And well, this is just example that already more than 10 years ago, it was uh, possible to simulate such a huge nanosystem. 
I mean, well, it's it has small dipoles and uh, a large um, dimension compared to this dipole, so as shown here. Also, we have a uh, graphical user interface, which is developed by Dmitry Smunyov. And, well, it's very nice for a quick start of the method, so you can understand what's possible. It's even will show you the particle that you simulate in, in real time, so you can change like parameters here and see how it uh, changes. Um, so maybe it's not that nice for uh, some high throughput uh, simulation, so, but to, to get used to the code, that's a really nice feature. Uh, Next, let me talk about some recent development of the code, uh, well, of the methods of the DDA in general, and well, some of them are related to other codes. So first of all, um, a scatterers near a substrate. So basically, if you have any system of particles, you can simulate them using, well, brute force, say, discretization. As I said, if you have infinite particle, you can always truncate it and uh, try to approach the limit of infinite particle. But if you have a particle near infinite uh, subset, that would be inefficient. So what uh, we implemented uh, about 10 years ago uh, is uh, that you can actually discretize only the particle and then uh, change the green stanza, which uh, basically describes interaction of two voxels in the particle. So you change it to the one which includes the interaction through the substrate. And using this, you can uh, you can limit your discretization to the particle itself. And basically the whole solution will be not much uh, slower, maybe, I don't know, 50% slower than, if you, than for, for the particle in free space. So that's very good, and uh, that was, uh, well, described in this publication. Now you can use it in add uh, without any effort. Uh, well, the, here is just one example that you can get accuracy within a width of the line by comparing it with other methods. So that's a sphere with evanescent illumination. So if you have some non-applications like that, or maybe you have, I don't know, some biological cells lying on a substrate, Again, this all can be rigorously considered uh, in simulations. Uh, then what I think is relevant for this conference is that you can have any incident field in other. Uh, well, actually in any code, there is usually a possibility to get an incident field from file. So you can use anything that you want. But in other a convenient feature that uh, for two years we have um, implemented a wide variety of basal beams which are built into the code. So if you have a basal beam, you just specify it with a few parameters. Well, you need to read the manual to understand how exactly what you have in mind correspond to these parameters because uh, the classification of basal beam is actually quite complicated. The, but any basal beam can actually be uh, described uh, by one of the existing options. And that's why you can easily simulate well anything you want scattering by it or near field uh, for for some nanoparticle placed inside basal beam or something like that so all of it can now be conveniently simulated without well manually calculating the beam itself uh, also i mentioned about electron energy loss spectroscopy and just well one example that it's already again implemented in other can be used uh, uh, fundamentally, it seems kind of different. So you use a field of a passing electron instead of uh, some incident electromagnetic wave. Uh, however, you can simulate it. And by doing this, you can actually reproduce experimental data, which can be obtained with modern electron microscopes. So if you ever consider such applications, well, keep in mind that uh, DDA and ADDA in particular can be used to uh, simulate these, uh, uh, these quantities. Also, I would like to note some recent development in terms of the circle and preconditioner. So I mentioned before that many standard preconditioners and preconditioner is something, well, basically it's, it's a way to modify your interaction metric so that iterative method will converge faster. So that's basically some standard things from the linear algebra. 
as a physicist, uh, we don't really need to know it, but there is a lot of mathematics about it. But many of the of of these uh, does not apply because it will break the structure of the matrix. Uh, by contrast, uh, circle and preconditioners, uh, which are mentioned here, are the ones that keep this uh, structure of the matrix, and that's why they basically can give you some acceleration for free. However, all existing applications. Uh, well, uh, not application, but implementations of this preconditioner, they break FFT acceleration at least along one axis. So if you have like a large uh, particle with some similar dimensions, usually that won't help a lot. However, if you have a very elongated particle, well, very flat or elongated, then uh, this may help a lot. And it was shown like for some huge ice crystals, which are very elongated, have some like hundreds of microns. Uh, in dimension. Or if you have a particles inside a multi-layered substrate where the FFT acceleration along the perpendicular normal direction does not work anyway. So in these cases, it works. Here are a few examples, but it's still kind of development in process. So I'm not sure that you can use some ready to use codes for these uh, preconditioners. I mean, in, in, when you just, if you just want to do some simulations that would be not easy to to use it in in some code and uh well final application is a calculation of a team matrix so well the standard scattering problem is like that you have some incident field and then you compute scattering in all directions but suppose you have many incident directions or orientations so this will look something like that and uh, in general, uh, well, I think many of you know that t matrix is, well, one of the way to describe the complete linear response of the particle. So if you know t matrix, then you can solve this problem, scattering problem for any incident direction, or you can do orientation averaging, for example. Uh, so this gives you all the information that you need. And also vice versa. So if you are able to solve your problem for many different incident directions, you can retrieve the t matrix. And that's uh, the ba that's the basis uh, which was well, which is known quite for a long time that using any uh, light scattering simulation method or actually any code, you can compute the tinematics of the particle. But the most straightforward way would be uh, through independent solution for different incident directions, which means that it will be much uh, slower than just to solve one scattering problem. However, once you do it. Well, okay, you have this thematics and then you can get answer, well, almost for free, so almost at no time for any incident orientation interaction. And, well, if, if you have some application which can benefit from such approach, I would like to tell you that uh, recently, so this year, uh, there was released a ready-to-use tool. Uh, Krzysztof Tchaikovsky made it, well, with... If, if some minor help for me. Uh, so that's uh, this link. And also a paper which is actually about many different methods used to compute the thematics, but also describing uh, this tool uh, has been recently submitted to jqsrt. So it's also available at archive if you are interested. And uh, finally, but I think most importantly, it's you need to keep in mind the accuracy of the simulation because so far I was telling okay it's you can apply uh, the codes I mean codes are easy to use you can download them put your particle in define the scattering problem and get some results but if you want to actually use these results you need to understand whether they are accurate or not at least to some extent uh, so as I mentioned DDA is a reliable method and it's numerically exact but it has user tunable parameters so you you so it means that you can't use it as a black box. So if you just run it, there is no guarantee that the accuracy will be satisfactory, what, however you define it. Uh, so if you use it, it's actually your like user's responsibility to test it on some similar shapes. Uh, and mind that spheres are special. So, well, it's, it's better than nothing, but I always urge uh, people to... You use not only spheres for testing uh, the accuracy of the method in the uh, simulation. So you can compare with other methods where possible. 
uh, it's possible to use a number of different discretization or different formulations. And finally, like the best option, I would say, is to use Richardson extrapolation. Then you can actually put numbers on expected accuracy. And what is this? If you have not heard about Richardson extrapolation, that's, I think, one of the best thing you can know about because it's actually applicable to a wide variety of methods and for any methods it can give you some drastical improvement well not necessarily but in many cases it gives drastical improvement for almost no cost so the idea is very simple for example you have well dda and it depends uh, mostly on a single parameter which is discretization parameter it's basically some dimensional scaled size of the voxel or dipole and then for any size of this dipole you can perform your simulation and once you do it you put some number like uh, extinction cross section on this graph well here we have a true solution but it's not necessary because if you don't have true solution you will just plot not the error but the number itself and once you have several numbers on this plot you, you can make an extrapolation so well there is some theory whether you should use linear or quadratic extrapolation and in which cases but here are examples of quadratic extrapolation and you see that uh, well for maybe for uh, uh, green it's not obvious that it improves but say for red one so you make extrapolation i think here it's to nine best points and you get almost your error decreases like 10 times. And also you have, uh, you see this error bars on the graph, which are also consistent. So even for green one, okay, you get it completely off, but the error bars actually honestly show you that, okay, you are not that accurate. So uh, this is described in this paper. And also a few examples can be found more recently. Uh, but general idea is that if you have your simulation for a few discretization points, even if you don't have any reference solution by other method, you can still uh, estimate your accuracy. And that's what I recommend for any DDA simulations, because otherwise uh, simulations, well, don't really have any well-defined meaning. So conclusion, uh, DDA is conceptually simple, general and powerful method. A mature open source codes exist, so it can be used for a wide variety of physical problems, even uh, some non-linear quasi-classical ones. So I have showed some examples. If you're interested in anything else, ask me a question. Uh, well, I have not talked about effective indices, but don't expect that it will work fine everywhere. Sometimes, uh, for example, iterative method does not converge. And, uh, well, sometimes you can tune something, sometimes uh, you can't really um, do anything with it. Uh, so also with size. So if the particle is large and not absorbing and also high contrast, you can expect uh, problems. So with accuracy, you may and also, well, should, I think, pay attention to accuracy and try to estimate it and methods for this exist. Uh, concerning the codes, there are a number of them and I can recommend other for general usage. And uh, we have a discussion group, which is, well, kind of other related, but any DDA questions or announcements are welcome. So please take a look. And if we are looking into the future, so what uh, can further be improved? Well, actually a lot. Uh, first of all, multi-layered substrate, although a code for that already exists. Um, also, I mentioned both substrate and complex beams, but for now they can't be combined. So if you want like a bezel beam near surface, you still need to compute yourself how the bezel beam will re reflect from the substrate. Uh, absorbing host medium, that's another fancy topic. And in principle, doing some simulations is already possible, uh, but there is still some confusion in terms of uh, what observable, so what scattering quantities and how to properly define them. So that's a separate subject. Uh, in principle, DDA can be used even at complex frequency, for example, to compute Casimir forces. Already there is some um, preliminary work on that, but still a lot to do. The same with non-local primitivity. And one large uh, future work is magnetic materials, because for now I was talking about, uh, and all the simulation, most of the codes apply only to the 
case of non-magnetic materials. And if you have magnetic, well, it all becomes at least twice more complicated in terms of computations, etc. cetera. Uh, also, if you just increase the size of the particle, okay, you start having problems. So there are some ideas that potentially DDA can be hybrid, hybrid design diced with some geometrical optics. But again, we are waiting for some breakthrough in this direction. And similarly, if you have many repeated simulations, uh, for example, for some parameter sweeps applications, when you build a database and vary all the parameters of the particle, then uh, you can use block iterative methods, uh, but still there is no like ready to use solution in this respect. And for preconditioners also, a lot more ideas. So thank you for your intentions. I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators over the years for the DDA development. Uh, well, some of them are shown here. I could not really list everyone. And current funding is uh, from Normandy region by Project Radaira. Uh, so thank you for your intention. I would be glad to answer your questions.